Hi, I'm Peter Turla, and I'm a worship associate here at Horizon. I'm happy to welcome you to our worship service. And if you want to know more about our church, please visit our website at horizonuu.org. And we'd also like to invite you to our virtual coffee hour. And if you want to find the link, it's on our website. And with no further announcements, our worship service will now begin. Friends, we gather here this morning in this liminal, virtual, wondering, uncertain space to consider our relationships to one another. We wonder how to deepen, how to live, and how to love. So I hope you bring the fullness of your heart here, the overburdened heart, the bruised and hurting heart, the cautiously hopeful heart, the content and joyful heart. It is safe here to be known. So come, let us worship together. Please join me now in saying together the words of our affirmation. Love is the doctrine of our church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in harmony with the earth. Thus do we covenant together.
Our share of the plate offering this morning goes to the Afaya Center, an organization committed to reproductive justice. Hear these words from their mission statement. The Afaya Center is committed to transforming the lives, health, and overall well-being of Black women and girls by providing refuge, education, and resources. We act to ignite the communal voices of Black women resulting in our full achievement of reproductive freedom. The offering will now be joyfully given and received. Our first reading this morning is called The Seven of Pentacles by Marge Piercy. Under a sky the color of pea soup, she is looking at her work growing away there actively, thickly like grapevines or pole beans, as things grow in the real world, slowly enough. If you tend them properly, if you mulch, if you water, if you provide birds that eat insects a home and winter food, if the sun shines and you pick off caterpillars, if the praying mantis comes and the ladybugs and the bees, then the plants flourish, but at their own internal clock. Connections are made slowly. Sometimes they grow underground. You cannot always tell by looking what is happening. More than half the tree is spread out in the soil under your feet. Penetrate quietly as the earthworm that blows no trumpet. Fight persistently as the creeper that brings down the tree. Spread like the squash plant that overruns the garden. Gnaw in the dark and use the sun to make sugar. Weave real connections. Create real nodes. Build real houses. Live a life you can endure. Make love that is loving. Keep tangling and interweaving and taking more in. A thicket and bramble wilderness to the outside, but to us, interconnected with rabbit runs and burrows and lairs. Live as if you liked yourself, and it may happen. Reach out. Keep reaching out. Keep bringing in. This is how we are going to live for a long time. Not always, for every gardener knows that after the digging, after the planting, after the long season of tending and growth, the harvest comes. I invite you to join me now in a moment of meditation or prayer, after which we'll sing or listen to our responsive hymn, Spirit of Life. Loving God, Spirit of Life, 
mystery of all that is, draw near to us this morning and know our hearts. We dwell in gratitude this morning for another day, for breath that fills our lungs, for another chance to just be here on this plane of existence. It's easy to forget to give thanks for just existing. Remind us gently. We give thanks too for the world around us, for all that grounds us when we feel anxious and fluttery, for leaves and trees and skies and sunsets and all the ways that we are a small part of something, for the interconnected web in which we live, we give thanks. Spirit of justice, guide all those marching around the country this weekend for reproductive rights. We are tired of the marching and yet we show up anyway. Our hearts are with all who are sick this morning or exhausted or simply didn't feel like it today. May they be well, may they be loved. Spirit, help us to take responsibility for all the ways we may have caused harm, even when we're unsure of the way forward. For we are called to try again. We are called onward by love. May love tug us gently, step by step. May it be so. Amen. Our second reading this morning is called We Need One Another by George E. O'Dell. We need one another when we mourn and would be comforted. We need one another when we are in trouble and afraid. We need one another when we are in despair, in temptation, and need to be recalled to our best selves again. We need one another when we would accomplish some great purpose and cannot do it alone. We need one another in the hour of success when we look for someone to share our triumphs. We need one another in the hour of defeat when with encouragement we might endure and stand again. We need one another when we come to die and would have gentle hands prepare us for the journey. All our lives we are in need, and others are in need of us. So it is now October, and our Soul Matters theme for this month is cultivating relationships. So we'll be talking a lot about connections, about deepening relationships, about what it means for us as Unitarian Universalists to be a covenantal tradition and also about how we can honor relationships with those who have passed on from this life. So today I'm gonna to lay some of that foundation for conversations we're gonna have later this month about covenant and about how we want to be together. Before we can do all of that though, before we can think about our promises to one another, we need to think deeply about how exactly it is that we build relationships. For some of us, and I would count myself among them, this is one of the most intuitive parts of being human, something that we do naturally, something that many of us believe we are here on this earth to do specifically, 
to connect with others during our short existence. But I would say it's not always that easy. In Unitarian Universalism, we've long said that we do a great job of talking about the first and the seventh principle, inherent worth and dignity, which we talked a lot about last week, in the interconnected web. And sometimes we kind of leave the rest. And I'm guilty of this and will be guilty of this again this morning, but I promise we won't make a habit of it. I think I've said before that the interconnected web is one of the closest descriptors I found for my connection to what I call God, what you might call the universe, or what you may not even try to name. I would add too that the web analogy is all the more meaningful because it includes our connections to one another, which is where I believe that God really lives. Theologian Henry Nelson Wyman, one of our spiritual ancestors as Unitarian Universalists, believed that God exists and can actually be created in the connections between people. And I know that for many of us, the idea of a God doesn't connect. That's not where we find meaning. I think, though, that this idea is important and powerful enough to translate beyond the idea of a God at all. Is there not something special or maybe even magical that can live in the connections between people? Don't you find the idea that something can be created in the space between us enticing and exhilarating? Because I do. Whenever I think about this, I envision a spider web glistening with dew in the morning sunlight. And as the spider climbs to one part of the web, the other parts are gently tugged this direction or that. We all impact one another. This is hardly a new idea, and I think throughout the past year and a half, we've heard it again and again and again. And it's become all the more frustrating as our fate is tied to those who vote and live and believe completely differently than we do. It is maddening and awe-inspiring all at once. If we don't learn how to live together in peace, we may not live at all. We talked last week about the wonderings among us about justice and activism, those questions of, are we doing the right thing? Are we making progress? But of course, we hold those same wonderings about our connections as well, especially right now. How will we maintain our connections while we're apart, while it's not safe yet to gather for worship and all of the other things that we do? Relationships, our connections to one another, these are at the heart of what gives life meaning, both inside and outside of religious community. We said last week that one of the main reasons to join a church is to be a part of something. But along with that, it's also to find other people who want to be a part of that same something. People who care about the things that you care about. I came across these words this week from the Reverend Marcus Liefert in a book called Becoming, a UU Guide to Adulthood, that I think speak to this. He writes, Unitarian Universalists are mosaic makers. We are a people who bring together the broken pieces of our histories and the shining pieces of our seeking and piece by piece create a mosaic religion. Grout, the chalky, gritty stuff that is squeezed between the cracks of tiles. In a mosaic, the grout holds the image together, unifying disparate pieces into a whole. The grout of a community takes years to lay and settle. Grout happens in board meetings, in committee meetings, in endless emails, and slow-moving institutions. It is in weekly potlucks shared by neighbors, a ride to church, and coffee in the social hall after worship. While the folks who show up for church only on Christmas and Easter will hopefully enjoy the beauty of the mosaic they find, they may never know the power of the grout that holds us through all the seasons of life. 
and we help to make the ground when we learn each other's names and when we reach out across generational divides. We help to make the grout when we show up on Sunday morning without having checked first to see if we're interested in the sermon topic. When a newborn arrives to be blessed by the community, it is the grout that enables us to welcome them. And it is in the grout that we rest when we gather to grieve and memorialize a beloved one who has died. From each of our jagged edges, give us the shape of a communal beauty. I particularly love this reflection on relationships and the ways of congregational life because it doesn't shy away from the messiness. Grout is messy and complicated and ideally it holds together pretty well. You can see the patterns made when the tiles lie together and it can weather some hard storms. Both Reverend Marcus and Marge Piercy are getting at the same thing, I believe, the, that the monotonous and everyday work, the less shiny and flashy parts, are where we become solid, where we get glued together. I think in these times we are missing the grout. Not that we don't have it, but we're lamenting and mourning the ways in which we no longer see it. One of the things I remember noticing when we switched to virtual classes was that those people I used to say hi to almost daily, walking to class or in the library, those people that were more than acquaintances but not quite friends, I completely stopped seeing them and now probably won't see them again. And yet when I think about the grout, the cups of coffee, the board meetings, the check-ins, the emails, I can still feel it. It is still here. It's in the ways you show up for one another, in the food dropped off for friends, in the picnics and the marches and the birthday parties, in rituals for fall equinox, honoring the spiritual paths of one another walking the labyrinth together, noticing the brightness of the moon, and in all of this holding a willingness still to be in awe. These are where connections are made, where we tend to our relationships. In the words of Reverend Scott Taylor, our society teaches us to ask, what do I want? Our religion invites us to ask, Whose am I? Two very different questions that lead to two very different lives. One question walks us down the path of accumulation and clinging. The other points to the way of community and connection. One says we find fulfillment in success. The others say we find ourselves in belonging. So which question will we allow us to lead? Marge Piercy has become one of my favorite poets over the last few years because of the tactile and sensual quality of her phrasing. You can feel her words. And the question about connection is real because there are few things that we need in order to form relationships. The first, I think, is time. As Marge Piercy reminded us earlier, connections are made slowly. Reach out, keep reaching out, build real connections, create real nodes. This is how we are going to live together for a long time. She mentions, and I'm reminded of roots spreading out in the dirt, gnarled and twisted, intertwined, complicated, and yet they hold the whole tree up. So much of what is taking place is hidden, but we don't have to see everything in front of us to know that it's there. We also need to try to have some sense of who we are. This doesn't mean we have to have everything figured out to have people in our lives that care about us, certainly not. And ideally life is long and self-discovery is longer. 
learning about ourselves and how we are with others will be forever kind of work. And we need to try to do a little of this work in order to engage with one another. We also need a place where it's safe to be our authentic selves. We can't make connections if we can't be seen and known. Someone said to me a couple weeks ago in a totally different context, Horizon has to offer what we always have to offer, which is a welcoming environment where people don't have to hide who they are. It takes time for most of us to reveal ourselves to others. It's like a flower unfurling its blooms. Slowly but surely, beauty emerges. The soul opens. In the words of the Reverend Raymond Bond, human encounter is common. Human acceptance is rare. Religious community is people reaching through all the facades people carefully place around them. The most radical contribution religion can make to human living is that it enables people to experience religious community as starkly as hunger. It is participating, it is participation in a religious community that stabs our consciousness into this awareness. Reverend Bond served UU congregations, I believe in the 1960s, not long after Unitarians and Universalists merged. And yet, I believe that his words still ring true today. Acceptance is rare and is also what many of us come seeking. There's that famous Mother Teresa quote, we are here to love and to let ourselves be loved. But of course, it's the be loved part that's harder because to be loved by other people, we have to allow ourselves to be seen for who we really are. And for most of us, how we really are is somewhat different than how we want to be in the world. We can try all we want, but we are imperfect human beings, always trying to do better and sometimes making mistakes. And we are lovable just the same. It's there in our imperfections that the beauty of relationship comes into play. There are no perfect people, perfect churches, or perfect ministers, but we say come anyway. Come anyway. Come and bring your gifts of imperfect, imperfection here, and we will love you in our own imperfect way. This is the basis for everything else we do as a community. We will try to love one another, slowly, surely. And so when things get hard and we wonder what we're doing here, how things in the future will be, how we will maintain our connections, I encourage you to remember that being seen for who we truly are, being known and loved however imperfectly, these are the things that make life worth living. And they're also the things that cannot be erased by time and distance. It goes back to the Maya Angelou quote, people will forget what you said or did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. This is the magic I was talking about earlier that Wyman wrote about as God that I believe can be created between us if we want to, if we really want to. This is the foundation we will build on. This is how we will love together for a long time. May it be so. Amen. We extinguish the flame of this chalice, but not our commitment to our mission to welcome radically, love boldly, grow spiritually, and to serve courageously. We carry this commitment in our hearts because we envision a beloved community filled with compassion, helping all to thrive in a just world.
Friends, as we go forth from our time together this morning, my hope for you is that you allow yourself to be seen and known for who you truly are. Go in peace. <laughs>